As we prepare to hear God's word for us today, let us first come together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts to the wonders of your work and the wisdom of your word. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the word incarnate. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and may be found on page 2 in the Pew Bible if you would like to follow along. The second reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, the second chapter, verses 27 through 28, and may be found on page 37 in the New Testament section of your Bible. Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. And now from Mark. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the past 10 years, my family has taken a cross-country trip out west with the purpose of meeting other family members in Yellowstone National Park to hike and enjoy God's beautiful creation. Five of those 10 years, we drove back and forth across the country, mapping out different routes in order to visit some of the states we hadn't yet visited, to see Capitol buildings we hadn't yet seen, and get to know this glorious country. This summer will be different, as we will not be making that cross-country drive. Instead of meeting family members in the mountains of Wyoming, we will meet them on the beach in North Carolina. This is disappointing for some of the family. But summer rhythms, routines, and habits change. And so we're in the process of getting used to these changing summer patterns. I know some of you have summer patterns, practices, and habits that similarly you engage in year after year. I've learned that some families go to their lake houses in Minnesota and Michigan for the summer. Some of you visit your family cabin on an island in Maine. Some of you spend summer weekends at Bethany or Rehoboth or the Jersey Shore or the Delaware beaches. Some of you are here during the summer months but are away in Florida for the winter months. In many ways, as we move through and think through our July and August summer rhythms, we engage in a kind of Sabbath-keeping practice. For many of us, summertime is when we're able more fully to cease our frenetic pace of life, to get a bit more rest, to embrace a slower rhythm, and to feast on time with family and friends. Several years ago, I read author Marva J. Dawn's book entitled, Keeping the Sabbath Holy, Ceasing, Resting, Embracing, Feasting. I was thinking that this summer was a good time for us to re-engage with the practice of Sabbath and dust off Professor Dawn's book, so that we can more closely and more deliberately understand Sabbath rhythms and habits for ourselves and what it means for us this summer. I will loosely follow the structure author Marva Dawn uses in her book, Keeping the Sabbath Holy. Today, we'll explore the Sabbath practice of ceasing. 
and next Sunday, resting. The first Sunday in August, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we'll explore feasting and then conclude the Sabbath series the second Sunday in August while trying to understand the concept of embracing Sabbath. Much of what I'm sharing with you comes from Professor Don's book. Author Donna Shaper, in her book entitled Sabbath Keeping, addresses the difficulty that you and I have with this topic. Shaper writes, Sabbath faces a real problem. Work, not rest, is what our culture values. We may be desperate for other values and other rituals than those of work, productivity, and effort, but until we honor values other than work, we probably will not have other rituals either. Sabbath keeping values our ability to rest, not merely our ability to work. In Sabbath, we live in God's economy, where our purpose is not production, but play. In keeping Sabbath, we measure ourselves by a different yardstick. We try to see how much delight we can take in the world, not how much we can get done. We can delight in how much we leave unfinished and open, a gift to God, not how much we can finish off. Sabbath is a way of living, not a thing to have or a list to complete. So what are we talking about when we say keeping the Sabbath holy? In the preface to her book, Marva Dawn writes, to keep the Sabbath holy means to recognize that the rhythm of six days of work and one day of ceasing work is written into the very core of our beings. To observe that order week by week creates in us a wholeness that is possible only when we live in accordance with this pattern being graciously commanded by God. Professor Dawn does not enter into the debate about whether the Sabbath should be observed on Saturday the true seventh day of Jewish custom, or on Sunday, set apart by earliest Christians as the Lord's Day. What she stresses is the importance of having that rhythm or that habit of Sabbath observance, that a particular day is set aside and observed faithfully every seven days so that God can imbue us with God's rhythm of six days of work and one day of ceasing work. What's crucial is to have a whole day long to move as the Spirit leads. So to keep Sabbath isn't a legalistic duty, rather living in accordance with our own natural rhythm gives freedom, the delight of one whole day in seven set apart as holy. So Sabbath keeping is not meant to be legalistic. As Jesus said in our gospel reading according to Mark, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the name Sabbath comes originally from the Hebrew verb Shabbat, which means primarily to cease, to desist. The passage we heard read from Genesis may be translated that God ceased on the seventh day. So today, our Sabbath focus is on ceasing. From what do you and I need to cease in order to delight in God? In her book, Professor Dawn encourages the reader to consider many and varied aspects of ceasing. To cease not only from work itself, but also from the need to accomplish, from the need to be productive. To think about ceasing from worry and tension that accompany our modern criterion of efficiency. 
ceasing from our efforts to be in control of our lives as if we were God, perhaps you and I need to cease from our possessiveness and from the humdrum and meaninglessness that result when life is pursued without God at the center of it all. So the question is, from what do you and I need to cease in order to delight in God? Now, to cease working is the original meaning of Sabbath. What about those who have to work on Sundays? Doctors, nurses, pastors, etc. On the one hand, it's important to avoid legalism about Sabbath keeping. As has been said, Jesus himself healed on the Sabbath. And yet the Gospels strongly and frequently affirm that he faithfully observed the Sabbath. On the other hand, some people will necessarily have to make their Sabbath another day besides Saturday or Sunday if it's to be a day without work. The important thing is to make that day of ceasing from work a regular rhythm of keeping the Sabbath. My Sabbath is Friday, for example, and I often fail at honoring it, but God's design of the Sabbath rhythm was never meant to impose a legalistic duty, so I'm all for allowing ourselves grace when we fail at honoring the Sabbath, and we will fail. The idea is to imagine the glorious relief knowing that every week in the rhythm of our lives, there's one day that we can cease from our working. The very process of ceasing from work uncorks our spontaneity and frees our childlike ability to play and delight. The freedom to play is a direct result of ceasing from work. So our question to ponder and to help us into, get into this idea of keeping the Sabbath holy is from what do you and I need to cease in order to delight in God? Perhaps it's ceasing from work that's the focus for you today, or maybe it is ceasing from productivity an accomplishment that you need to focus on for yourself. The criterion for everything in our society has become efficiency. Trying to accomplish a lot is one of the ways we seek to satisfy our deep longing or our restlessness of our existence. We will never satisfy our longing for God with the accomplishments of our own efforts. But we keep on trying. And we also judge the worth of others on that same basis. Yet we still find ourselves yearning for something more. Setting aside a holy Sabbath means that we can cease our productivity and our accomplishments for one day in seven. Perhaps ceasing from worry and setting aside anxiety in order to celebrate Sabbath more fully is where you need to focus your attention. The Sabbath isn't a running away from problems, but the opportunity to receive grace to face them. To celebrate the Sabbath is to rejoice in God's presence. Practicing the gift of thanksgiving is one way to cease worrying for just one day in seven. Maybe in order to live into Sabbath, you find you need to cease from trying to be God. A major blessing of Sabbath keeping is that it forces us to rely on God for our future. On that day when we keep Sabbath, we do nothing to create our own way. We abstain from work, 
from our incessant need to accomplish and produce, from all the anxieties about how we can be successful, and we abstain and cease from thinking about all that we have to do to get ahead. The result is that we can let God be God in our lives. And letting God be God in our lives does not, of course, mean passivity. We do not simply sit back and say, God is in charge of our work. Rather, when we get our priorities straight and remember that God is God and that we're merely God's servants, we are empowered to do all that we can to be good stewards of the gifts and resources we've been given. In other words, I am freed to work better during the times when I'm aware of God's direction and provision and empowerment in my daily tasks, intentional Sabbath keeping, ceasing from my striving to be God, also makes it more possible for me to think of all the work I do in the week, during the week, as worship. So you and I will recognize the healing that can and will take place in our lives when we get into the ry rhythm or habit every seventh day of setting aside all our efforts to provide for ourselves and make our way in the world. A great benefit of ceasing on the Sabbath, Sabbath is that we learn to let God take care of us, not by becoming passive and lazy, but in the freedom of giving up our feeble attempts to be God in our own lives. Because deep inside each and every one of us, there is a longing for completion, a longing for wholeness, for something more. And there are all sorts of temptations in our culture that compete to satisfy that yearning, that longing. Only holy time in which we experience the presence of God can fill that emptiness. We are at times more aware of that yearning, of that longing for completion than at other times. But that yearning, that longing is always there. St. Augustine put it this way, our souls are restless until they rest in thee, O God. Perhaps a Sabbath-keeping practice will help us assuage that yearning, that restlessness, that longing that we encounter that's lodged deep within. And perhaps a Sabbath-keeping practice will provide an entree for you and for me toward health and wholeness. So this week, beginning today, Let's each one of us think on this. From what do you and I need to cease in order to delight in God and in order to keep the Sabbath holy? A most blessed Sabbath to you today. Amen. Amen.